Okay, well, let, let, me, let me begin. Um, just just uh, let me start by, by saying that the paleoclimate world has been taken in vain by almost every speaker who has spoken here today. And so I'm really taking a chance by, by, by focusing on issues that, that are raised, uh, raised by paleoclimate observations. But that's the story. Um, if you could keep this, no, go back one to the... You're going, uh, I, maybe I better do this. <laughs> um, the, the screen, we lost the screen. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, uh, rapid climate change, again focusing on the influence of variations in the intensity of the Atlantic meridional Overturning. We overturn the projection. <laughs> Circulation. <laughs> that was the CO2 effect, by the way. <laughs> but it's not a bulb issue this time, obviously. Any professor should be able to talk about pictures. I had the experience of listening to, to uh, Michael McIntyre recently trying to escape from the failure of a VHS tape and Michael talked for far too long without any props. <laughs> All I can say it was a total disaster. I do not intend to repeat. But what I'm going to talk about are, are uh, rapid climate changes in the paleo record that uh, largely occurred during times uh, in earth history when these massive accumulations of land ice were either uh, extant on the surface or in the process of disappearing, and I'm going to focus on the range of time primarily from last glacial maximum to the present, uh, in which the impact of the melting of these ice masses uh, has been hypothesized to have had a huge effect on the mock uh, on, uh, on, uh, on at various times. Okay, so let me just begin by reminding you of the, of the data which are driving all of this discussion. Uh, first, just the uh, data from the GRIP ice core. This is from one of Sigfus Johnson's uh, papers. You'll know that Sigfus is famous for having designed the cheap European drill, which was actually able to get to bedrock considerably before the Americans were able to get there. <laughs> and so when you talk to Sig Sigfus about, the <laughs> about these data, he's extremely proud of the, of the uh, technical accomplishment. But main issue here is that Holocene is, as seen in oxygen isotopes, is a very stable period of time relative to the glacial, especially during oxygen isotope stage 3 from about 60,000 years ago up to uh, around 20,000 years ago, 25,000 years ago. There's evidence of very intense instability. These, of course, um, uh, take the form of what we've come to call dansgaard oschger oscillations, uh, which are bundled together in what's been called a bond cycle into quintriplets or quadruplets of oscillations which are either initialized or ended uh, with, with a, what's called a Heinrich event. As you go further into the, uh, up towards the present, there is this most intense issue of reversion to almost full glacial conditions that occurs uh, during the Younger Dryas event. And it's of course <coughs> this Younger Dryas event which has served as the touchstone, if you like, for much of the discussion um, that's, that, that we have been having about the origin of rapid climate changes. But there are real issues with respect to the extent to which the Younger Dryas has been linked irrefutably to a shutdown of the mock, which is caused by the delivery of fresh water into the Atlantic by the melting of the Laurentide ice sheet. And I want to go through that story a little bit, but before I do, I want to remind you of the extent to which all of these millennial time scale fluctuations in climate, rapid climate changes, appear to be exported into the region, regions of the climate system, which are well beyond the North Atlantic sector. And here I'm showing you the uh, famous results from Jim Kenneth's record from the Santa Barbara Basin, which is basically a record of productivity um, uh, in that basin off the west coast of California, off the coast of California, basically showing these large fluctuations, large amplitude fluctuations, well dated in the core, uh, directly linked to the individual dansgaard oscar oscillations which are seen in the grip ice core. So the major issue, a major issue, 
aside from the issue as to why these rapid climate changes have occurred, is the issue as to how their influence has been exported uh, to lower latitude. So what I'm going to start by doing is focusing on the uh, interval of time between last glacial maximum uh, and present, focusing especially on the sequence of events that began with Heinrich event one, here nominally around 17,000 years before present, uh, leading into the onset of the bulling alarod transition, subsequent to which this intense cooling event, the Younger Dryas event, occurred, and uh, pointing you to the variations uh, in sea level, which have been reversed here. This is sea level change, so I can fit it on the same record. This is the so-called meltwater pulse one event, which Rick Fairbanks has carefully observed in the, in the Barbados sea level record, corresponding to a mean rise in sea level, a change in eustatic sea level, of something like 20 to 25 meters, a huge rise in eustatic sea level over a time scale we think is short of, uh, as, about, as about a century. If the Younger Dryas was caused by a shutdown of the Atlantic Mach, then why did meltwater pulse 1A not induce it immediately? Okay. Question number one. Suki Manabe's papers, you'll remember with um, Ron Stouffer and others, put this fresh water into the Gulf of Mexico, discovered that on a time scale in these low resolution GFDL models, that the mock shut down on a time scale of something like a few decades, decades totally. So there's clearly major physical problems with respect to our understanding of the interaction between fresh water runoff into the oceans and the response of the mock to these events. Right, and I want to talk specifically about these models, the problems with these models. <laughs> and just show you here, um, uh, Lynn Talley's nice uh, reconstruction uh, in terms of the salinity section from the WOS data set, um, constraining, uh, constraining uh, the form of the Atlantic, of the Atlantic overturning circulation. And now show you as well, just by reminiscence, before getting into the details of the discussion, this nice data set from McManus and others at Woods Hole based on the protactinium thorium tracer of the strength of the western boundary undercurrent, which is driven by the formation of North Atlantic deep water. This is a kinematic tracer. Of the, of the speed with which the western boundary undercurrent is transporting water from the north towards the south. And you'll notice, this is on the carbon time, radiocarbon time scale, and you'll notice in this data, here is Heinrich event one. Here is last glacial maximum. Here is modern. If we tune this modern measurement of the strength of the western boundary undercurrent to correspond to an overturning strength of, let's say, 18 spherdrups, then this would imply a strength of the mock at LGM of something like 30 to 40 percent lower. And it would suggest, this being the background value at 0.093 of this isotopic ratio, that Heinrich event one was followed by a near total shutdown of the mid-Atlantic overturning circulation. Okay, right? This was followed by a recovery according to these data, okay? And then a diminution again as you go into the Younger Dryas event, but a diminution which was not nearly total, but by something like another 30 or so percent in the strength that it retained after recovery following the near shutdown implied by these data um, inferred on the basis of the protactinium thorium tracer, okay? Yes. So, what basic what basically happening is that these these two isotopes right are daughter product products of the decay of radium 235 238 and they're basically differentially scavenged on particles so that as the water moves from the north to the south one of these isotopes is depleted relative to the other and the extent of the depletion depends on the speed with which the water is moving and the supply of the particles? 
and the supply, and the of, supply of the particles, and of course with the distance to the north yeah. that deep water. <laughs> yeah. Okay, right. It's okay. also one point. But it's a nice point, you have to admit. It's a nice point because... <laughs> in fact, it's a very nice point. McManus himself has data from elsewhere in the Atlantic which contradicts it. I've also seen very nice data sets which show the dependence of the extent of the reduction on exactly how far to the north. These are probably the data you're thinking of. Okay. So it's, it's a, there's a proximity to source effect in the in the extent of the dilution. It's, well, you know, it's an important question whether, on the basis of the measurement of a tracer at a single point in the North Atlantic Ocean, you can tell how much water is being exported. Yes, but this point, of course, is under the western boundary undercurrent, and so if you were to choose a point, that would be a good place well, to start. Oh, but it's a leap from a place under the western boundary undercurrent, which may not even have been in the same place in the glacial ocean. Anything further? <laughs> well, I mean, I, just a statement about caution. Yeah, no, we need to be. We need. We need to be. Point. We need to be cautious. But, but but it's part of this problem is the extrapolation from one point to a global inference. I'll maybe you. see more nice things than we can discuss in the end of jump all of it. <laughs> okay, so let me just start before I get into the details of, of the analysis with this cartoon, okay? Because what I want to draw your attention to is what has become the conventional explanation for the onset of the Younger Dryas, okay? The conventional <laughs> explanation for the onset of the Younger Dryas is that prior to its onset, all of the water from the proglacial lakes which had formed along the southwestern flank of the Laurentide Ice Sheet was draining to the south into the Gulf of Mexico, okay? At the onset of the Younger Dryas, Wally Broker has argued, is that suddenly there was a switch, right, of the routing of fresh water from the continent from the south to the east, okay? Out into the Gulf of St. Lawrence, thereafter out into the Mid-Atlantic, leading to a shutdown of the Mid-Atlantic overturning circulation. That has been the sort of conventional argument that he has promoted. Now, some of you may know that all of the efforts which have been made to try to see any evidence of this having happened have failed. There is not, a, there's not only no evidence <laughs> in support of this ever having happened, there's explicit evidence that it never happened. Okay? So this clearly raises the question as to whether freshwater forcing of the North Atlantic and a shutdown of the mock has anything to do with the Younger Dryas, okay? So that's the issue uh, which I'm going to go after now with a series of analyses to try to understand what probably happened <laughs> during the deglaciation event, okay? <clears throat> so I'm going to go through this series of analyses and basically the story is very simple. Um, it's to construct a methodology of accurately calculating okay, where the fresh water that is produced by the deglaciation of the North American continent actually runs off. What are the outlet points? When are they occupied? How much water hits the ocean and where? Okay? And if we can compute where and when various freshwater fluxes struck the, uh, the ocean basins, can we then translate those calculations into a direct calculation of what the influence on the mock should have been. So, to do this we have to start off by reconstructing a detailed evolutionary history of the uh, Laurentide Ice Sheet. Thickness versus time, okay? So let me just run very quickly over how we've, we've done this, okay? Because that's a necessary precondition to doing an accurate calculation of how much meltwater is produced where. So we have a number of data which are brought to bear on this problem. Data which have to be assimilated into, uh, into a model of continental scale ice sheet evolution. First data set. A detailed data set of where the margin, margins... Of, I'll talk about the model in a moment. Well, I want to know, since you have a different community than I am, just wanted to know what you technically call the model. I will describe 
precisely <laughs> the model that I'm going to describe when I actually describe how it's used. A part of the model will involve a digital elevation model, obviously, because we need to know which way is downhill, okay? <laughs> All right? Okay, so first piece of information we need, where was the ice as a function of time from last glacial maximum to present, okay? And to do this, um, what we've done is to rely upon a very detailed reconstruction in carbon time by Art Dyke at the Geological Survey of Canada with a 500-year uh, sampling interval in, in carbon age of where the margins were as a function of time, okay? So we have a new series of R, which are the highest resolution maps of this depiction of the retreat of Laurentide ice that, that have been created so far. Uh, and you can see the black is the margin at last glacial maximum around 21,000 years ago. The interior black is the remnant of LGM ice that existed, I should be on this side, sorry, is the remnant of LGM ice that existed on the North American continent uh, at 8,000 years ago, just after the timing of the 8.2 kilo year event, which you see in the Greenland ice core, okay? So at that time, the Hudson Bay had opened up Right? Um, and there was residual ice standing well away from Hudson Strait. Okay. Maybe you should push those buttons for me if I'm going to stand over here. The other sort of data we bring to bear on this are data which allow us to determine how thick the ice must have been in the regions where there was ice cover. First data set we use for this, and I have something like 150, 200 time series like this from the interior of the North American continent, which basically describe the rate, uh, the relative sea level history, the, 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 how shall I say, the rebound of the crust above sea level, which occurred through the glacial ice static adjustment process as the ice was removed, okay? So we have detailed observations of the recovery of the continent, right, following the removal of the ice. And this is, this is a direct measure of how the thick, how thick the ice must have been if you know where and when it was. Next uh, of these things, please. Go forward one more, please. One more, please. Other observations we have consist of space geodetic observations on radio telescopes, okay, from traverses through um, the North American continent. And these radio telescopes measure the present day rate of vertical motion present-day rate of change of the local radius of the Earth at the location of each of the radio telescopes. Again, direct measures of how much ice was removed and where. And you can see what we picked up in this uh, early analysis was a large discrepancy between the rate of uplift of the crust in this northwestern portion of the shield, right, compared to the space geodetic observations, indicating that there was not enough ice removed, given the good quality of fit to the other radio telescopic observations from both North America and Europe, that there was too little ice removed from this northwestern sector of the shield next. We have other data which we also use to measure ice thickness, and these are data that are t obtained from what we call absolute gravity instruments. Okay, they're basically tubes that are about this high, within which you drop basically ball bearings and you track the acceleration of the ball bearing in its free fall using a laser device. And you do about a thousand drops or two thousand drops to beat the noise down by root n. And you make a measurement of little g at one epoch of time. And then you go back and do it again six months later. Go back and do it again six months later. And you build up a time series of little g at every location at which you've made the sequence of measurements and you measure then a derivative of little g with respect to time. That's a direct measure of the rate at which the crust of the Earth is moving through the ambient gravitational field. It's also a direct measure of how thick the ice must have been that was removed from the surface of the planet. Next, Why please. So? I mean, I, I assume that you can measure both times now, but should that be the same? Uh, so that will be more, in particular, when you think of the Environment change to a These are predictions that are made at the present epoch of time using yeah. a full theoretical model of the process, okay? And we fit the theoretical model to the observations that I just showed you. But you've made the assumption that what you have now, and then you have some wisdom, which I'm not aware of, 
which I do not know, then you say, therefore, the fit, I can the just, fit, the f- from yeah. three years of data, I can extrapolate several thousand years back. No, no, you don't understand what, what we're doing at all. You make a measurement of the present day rate yeah. of dg by dt. Yeah, but an that, epoch, that's for three years, right? Right. Yeah. And then you have a model which is capable of predicting the full temporal evolution of little g. Yeah. And you also use that model to predict the local present day time derivative of little g. And you compare the fit of that theoretical model to the observations. I, mean, okay? I know models, and I know what I can do with models. And so it, I find it not so that I'm you entirely would, <laughs> without any doubt now. Uh, so why should I? I mean, it, there are a number of parameters in that model. I think, I think one general question that arises in this talk today or in this session is the question of predictive uncertainty of inversion and the utility of observations we are going to observe. And I think this is something which we might want to flag for a general, more detailed discussion. Yeah, I mean, I could if give, I, I I could give a four-hour talk on the model, but I, I, I don't care to do that. <laughs> because I want to focus on one of the types of analyses which have to be done in order to make the prediction which I wish to focus on, right? And this involves the use of these observational data to tune a full three-dimensional thermomechanical model of continental scale ice sheet evolution, right? so that it fits the totality of the observational constraints that can be brought to bear on it. And what I've been showing you here, qualitatively, is the uh, a list, if you like, of the data which are used in this tuning process. Now, the final piece of observational uh, data which goes into the tuning of this full three-dimensional thermomechanical model of continental ice sheet evolution is this map of the thickness of sediment that covers the northern part of the North American continent. This is actually a critical input to the ice sheet model because the existence of sediment cover under an ice sheet which is of order three or four kilometers thick is a principal determinant of how rapidly it can slip over the landscape. Okay? Right? So this picture is an input, another input, right, which is used to constrain the temporal evolution of this three-dimensional thermomechanical model uh, of continental ice sheet evolution. Now, the way in which this model is tuned, I need to comment to you very briefly. This is a full Bayesian calibration. This model has something like 20 control parameters, some to do with the viscosity that we choose to assign to the sediment that underlies the ice sheet at its base. We have parameters that depend upon, that determine the uh, temperature sensitivity of the viscosity of the ice itself. Okay? We have a large number of parameters. So what we do in this Bayesian calibration is to sample all of these model parameters randomly over an a priori predetermined physical range of plausibility and we generate a huge ensemble of model predictions of all of the observations that I've sketched for you here. Okay? What we then do is we design a series of sieves to which the output of the model are subject. Constraints which the model is obliged to fit. Okay? This winnows the large ensemble of runs of the continental ice sheet model and we use the winnowed data to train a neural network. Okay? We then use the trained neural network to generate a huge volume of data and we sample that data set using Markov chain Monte Carlo methods to try to put error bars on the model parameters. Okay? What I want to do is now to show you some of the statistical results that come from this Bayesian uh, analysis of the evolution of the Laurentide ice sheet. So if you could poke the next one for me, please. Can I just ask? So yeah, this of course. Is forward opti- optimization of, uh, inverse. It's forward optimization, yeah. So let me show you some properties of the model so produced by showing you one or two examples and then show you something of the range of plausible models that are able to fit the data. Forward, please. So here, a sample, here are a sample of four different models that come from this Bayesian calibration procedure. A minimum volume model, a maximum volume model, a model which best fits the RSL data relative sea level observations, a model which has the fastest flow of ice over the continent, just to sample the range of models which produce reasonably similar quality of fits 
to the full set of observational constraints, okay? This is a measure in terms of the sea level impact of the growth and decay of the Laurentide ice sheet over the last 100,000 year cycle. And this is a blow up of the last uh, 22,000 years of evolution of this uh, sample of four models. The model is delivering about half or so 10 to 12 meters sea level rise associated with meltwater pulse 1A. Only about half of the total, um, of the total uh, um, amplitude of that, um, of that phenomenon. If we look now at the spatial structure, next please, of the ice mass, what you'll see is it has a number of very um, uh, strong characteristics which are, which are char characteristics which are common to all of the models which fit the observations. In particular, the LGM structure of the Laurentide ice sheet prior to the beginning of its, of its disintegration is predicted to have three central, three domes, the major dome of which is sitting over the northwest sector of the shield, over the Kiwaitan sector of the shield. There's a secondary dome to the southeast of James Bay, and there's a tertiary dome that sits in the elbow of Baffin Island, okay? Coming naturally out of the Bayesian uh, calibrated model. Next, please. <coughs> These data of absolute gravity, A, B, C, D, E, and the single measurement of the vertical uplift of the crust at Yellowknife are crucial determinants, very small number of data, okay, are crucial determinants of the necessity of the maximum amplitude, maximum thickness of Laurentide ice lying to the northwest of Hudson's Bay. I should comment that uh, every previous attempt for uh, using a, um, uh, a continental scale ice sheet model like this to reconstruct what the Laurentide ice sheet must have looked like at LGM always puts a single central dome over Hudson's Bay itself. So this depiction of what the ice sheet must have looked like at LGM is radically different from anything which we've seen before, except if you give me the next slide. What is the elevation? A maximum thickness is over the Kiwaitan Dome or something like four and a half kilometers. Okay. And so the elevation thickness is three? Yeah, just under four. Next slide, please. I say that this was um, the first time the, a structure like this has ever been, been predicted with a model, but in fact, exactly this structure was predicted uh, in 1987. <laughs> by um, glacial geomorphologists simply on the basis of looking at, looking at observations of striations in bedrock, erratic dispersal patterns over the shield, okay? All of the conventional data which are employed in the field of glacial geomorphology. We get this structure out of the model because we have input into the base of the ice sheet, the impact on the rate at which ice can flow, which is associated with the sediment cover. And this forces high ice to exist over exposed crystalline basement. Wherever the surface is covered, is covered by sediment, the ice slips very quickly and is unable to expand to high, to high thickness. Next, please. So, we know, we think we know, we have a good model. We think we, we have a good model of the evolution of the Laurentide ice sheet, which, which finally occurs with a priori geomorphological observations. And what we want to do now is to model the runoff from the continents, and this involves knowing which way is downhill next. So we need to input a high resolution digital ele elevation model under the ice mass, right? And of course it's critical that that digital elevation model is hydrologically correct. That is, if you rain on it, all the rivers over the North American continent flow in the right direction, okay? <coughs> this elevation, this model, uh, is the USGS hydrologically self-consistent uh, uh, model, DEM, for the North American continent. What we've done, pardon me, this one is the high resolution uh, uh, USGS model, and what we've done here is to beat the resolution down in order that it match the resolution of the, of the, uh, of the ice sheet which is employed uh, in the detailed uh, analysis uh, of, it, of, its, of its evolution. But a critical addition onto this picture of today's elevation pattern is the impact on the, on the warping of the continent, which is produced by the glacial isostatic adjustment process. At glacial, at glacial maximum, 
the surface under the, the regions of maximum ice cover is depressed by something like a kilometer. And when the ice is removed, the surface relaxes in order to restore a state of gravitational equilibrium. All the river directions are continuously changing as a function of time, right? Because of the impact of, next slide please, that glacial ice static adjustment process for which we have a detailed formal theory which has been shown to fit all of the observations which can be brought to bear on it. So when we add, next slide please, the impact of the continuous warping of the surface onto the present day uh, digital elevation model, we're able to make predictions of runoff into all of the main outlets from which fresh water enters the ocean from the core of the North American continent. Let me draw your attention to this first uh, of the uh, time series. The error bars on this um, are error bars that come from the Bayesian calibration. Okay? We actually try to put error bars on these estimates by using that calibration process. The blue lines on each of these correspond to adding to the runoff produced by the melting of land ice the impact of the precipitation which the model has falling within the watershed that also um, uh, exits uh, through, through these uh, various routes. And I just draw your attention to this upper figure because it was this figure that Broker first used in his analysis of a record from the Or Orca Basin to argue that there was a switch in the system that occurred just prior to Younger Dryas onset. Younger Dryas onset began around 12,800 years ago in, in calendar years. Okay? You can see that it's exactly at that time that the runoff into the Gulf of Mexico is shutting down. So this analysis uh, suggests that Broker's analysis of the interpretation of the Orca Basin, Basin record is dead right. If you like. Exactly if that, you that pleases you better. Yes. Whatever, make, whatever makes you happy. <laughs> okay. You can see also that on this, from this route there's also a large pulse associated with meltwater pulse 1A. Okay. And you can immediately ask the question, okay, if this huge pulse of meltwater actually hit the Gulf of Mexico at meltwater pulse 1A time, what about the Manabi and Stouffer and other calculations which suggested that it should have shut down the mock. Well, you may be interested um, to know that new measurements made in the Gulf of Mexico by Aharon and others from uh, uh, US East Coast University have actually, for the first time, decided to look at the Del 18O signature differential between planktic and benthic forams. And what they've discovered is that although there is a very strong signature in the benthic forams of there having been a strong injection of meltwater at meltwater pulse 1A time, there's no appearance of a dilution event in the planktics at all. So it's very clear that the assumption in the Manabidal calculations that the fresh water exited out onto the surface of the Gulf of Mexico is wrong. It actually undercut the salt. Okay. And, and this should be a warning to anybody who's trying to build a model of global climate evolution which involves a description of explicit river runoff effects because it raises the question as to whether rivers always run off <laughs> onto the surface of the ocean or whether they can actually undercut the salt. And to reinforce this point, I uh, um, draw your attention to work of... Uh, John Bush and others at, 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 at MIT who've actually performed detailed uh, experiments of, uh, to answer the question as to, as to how much sediment you need to have suspended in river water in order that it actually undercut salt water. And they've discovered in these experiments, which I think are lovely, that the previously imagined sediment concentration that was required in order for a river to undercut the salt was, was over, overemphasized by, by about an order of magnitude. Okay? So I believe there's very clear evidence now in the paleo record and in detailed uh, fluid mechanical experiments 
to argue that Meltwater Pulse 1A, at least in the Gulf of Mexico, <coughs> did not go out <laughs> over the surface of the Gulf, <laughs> but actually undercut the salt. Now whether the same was true uh, here, where this Atlantic record is mostly, uh, mostly uh, fresh water that's ex exiting through um, the Hudson River outlet, whether the same is true in this case um, is less clear. But with the case of Old Muddy, the Mississippi, <laughs> it seems to me quite plausible that this is, the, that this is, the, this is a, a critical uh, uh, issue that needs to be taken account of when we talk about trying to reconcile the paleo record. Anyway, the main result of all this is the result which is shown here, right? Which is that the switch which occurs when the runoff into the Gulf of Mexico stops doesn't occur into the Atlantic, but rather it switches into the Arctic. Okay? So the switch is not from the south to the east, but it's from the south to the north. Okay? And so the issue then is, if there were uh, an episode of rapid freshening of the, of the Arctic Ocean, what would it do? What would it do to the mock? If I could have the next one, please. So, next one, please. So, first thing we need to do is to establish um, some plausibility of the ability of a coupled atmosphere ocean general circulation model to make anything like a rational prediction of the strength of the Mach. Peter's already addressed this in, in, in detail. And what we're using is a precursor model of the model uh, uh, for which uh, he was describing results, which is the CCSM3 model. We're using the CSM 1.4 model, which differs from CCSM 3 in that, at least in this one critical way, in that it has no river runoff scheme, scheme that's explicit to the model. Rather, what's done in uh, CSM 1.4 to ensure no salinity drift in the ocean, right, um, is just to compute the sum of, evap of precipitation onto the surface of the ocean, evaporation off the surface of the ocean, and then to balance these two uh, uh, components of the freshwater bu budget by multiplying the precipitation onto the ocean by a small factor so as to make certain that there's no mean salinity drift in the ocean. Okay? So this is the reason why this model has been chosen. What I'm showing you here is just its spin up to equilibrium under glacial conditions in blue represented through a number of simple integral properties uh, of the evolution of the model. But what happens during meltwater event? Do we still have constant salinity? No. What we're imagining during, during a meltwater event is that we have this huge reservoir of fresh water impounded as ice on the continent, and we're simply going to extract from that reservoir the fresh water we use to load the ocean. So salinity drift is then allowed to occur. Okay. So we spin this model up. We've had to spin it up for about 2,000 years to find the new statistical equilibrium. Right, which is an interesting comment in itself. Next, um, here are just uh, depictions of the mid-Atlantic overturning under glacial maximum, modern glacial maximum, and the difference situation. We see um, in going from modern to LGM that there's a marked shoaling of the North Atlantic overturning cell, uh, a marked increase in the incursion of Antarctic bottom water into the north and a diminution in the strength of the North Atlantic overturning cell of something like 40 percent. Okay? So I would argue, um, in spite of the fact that the <laughs> protactinium thorium data come from only a single point and so on and so forth, um, that these data are at least consistent with that, single, with that single observation of how the strength of the mock might have changed uh, at LGM. Next, please. So I think we have a model which um, we have some basis to believe gives a rational uh, description of how the mock has reacted in going from one state of statistical equilibrium roughly now to the state of statistical equilibrium which we think probably existed at LGM. And I say that because the LGM interval, you'll understand, is between two Heinrich events. Heinrich event one was centered around 17,000 years ago. Heinrich event two was well prior to the to the LGM time slice at 21,000 years before, before present. There seems to have been no 
strong event of ice ablation which occurred through the LGM interval. Okay? So we think that that time was a time, a, a time of, uh, in which a reasonable statistical equilibrium had been established. Next, please. So here are results which we've submitted based on the uh, CSM 1.4 analysis uh, to the CMIP, PMIP water hosing uh, intercomparison. And I'm just showing you a couple of results here. This is for North Atlantic average uh, surface temperature, North Atlantic coldest spot average, uh, averaged uh, uh, surface atmospheric temperature. Uh, at point 0.1 spheres, we get almost nothing happening, right? And this is discordant somewhat with the, with the CCSM 3.0 results, which show a slight diminution in the strength of the mock. At one sphere that we come very close, we produce maximum cooling, and as I'll show you, the circulation is almost shut down at one sphere. Okay. Next, please. Uh, these are just um, cooling through this range of time. Next, please. I won't bother to rotate it. It's, or this one. Next, please. Next, please. So what I want to do now is simply describe to you what happens if rather than applying that freshening event here between 50 degrees and 70 degrees north latitude, uh, we apply it here. Okay. Right. What is the net effect of the shift in the point of exit of the fresh water uh, on, the, on the strength of the mock, please? Well, these are the main results from this. Black is... Uh, fresh water forcing it at uh, one sphere up into the Arctic. Green is strength of the mock with one sphere up forcing into the North Atlantic. And also shown here are the sea ice extension results that correspond to these um, impacts of fresh water forcing. And you can see um, that whether you force in the Atlantic or whether you force in the Arctic, the response of this model at least is essentially identical except for about a few decade phase shift in the response of the mock when the freshening is applied is applied to the Arctic Ocean. What happens to temperature? Between these two? Well, do you get a younger drive? <coughs> yes, yes, very similar. Sure, uh, I haven't got that particular picture, but they're essentially identical. So it doesn't freeze? Expect. Pardon? It doesn't freeze in the Arctic? No, but there's very strong... No, it, I mean, no. It's already heavily covered with sea ice, of course. So you're dumping all the fresh water on top of the sea ice. Yes, and there's an increase in pack ice flux out of the, out of the Arctic, so, right? Right. Okay, so the, the physics, physics yes. lies with what happens when you dump fresh water yes. Yes. on top of the sea yes. ice. Yes. Can I ask one uh, technical question? So you have one sphere trip in about one of a hundred years. Or yeah. Something. Now the issue, the next order issue, of course, is. Uh, you know, uh, what, is, what about 0.2 sphere drops or 0.3 sphere drops, which actually come out of the, which actually come out of the calculation? I just want okay. to my question. Yes. So you dump this basically somewhere at a few grid points in the Atlantic, in the Arctic Ocean. Right? Over the Beaufort Sea. So in reality, you would create a huge ghost roll circulation of 10, 10 sphere drops or something, which your model cannot simulate because it's using virtual salt flux. Yes. So. Uh, mm -hmm. What do we learn from this? The first order effect is, is neglected. I'm not sure that that is a first order effect. It is. Oh. Okay. okay. For, for localized forcing of 10 spheres. Well, the, the forcing is, I mean, the forcing is over several grid squares outboard of the Mackenzie River outlet. Right. Okay. A large patch of the Arctic Ocean. Still, you would whatever, uh, mult multiply your normal freshwater flux, which induces vorticity. In, yeah, in yeah, the ocean by yeah, yeah, yeah. a factor of five or ten or something. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah, yeah. I just wanted to check. Yes. Next, please. So our argument as to why as to why this happens, why there is such a large similarity between what happens when you hose in the Atlantic as compared to what happens when you hose in the Arctic, is when you hose in the Atlantic, of course, the North Atlantic drift will transport the fresh water up into the Gen Seas and kill the thermal haline circulation. When you freshen the Arctic Ocean, the argument is that the transpolar drift will do the same thing. But what I want to uh, um, point out to you here is that all of these freshening calculations in the first instance have been done on modern climate. Okay? 
They've been done on the modern climate system, okay? Not on the climate regime which would have existed uh, at LGM, or better, the climate regime that would have existed uh, post the bowling alarod time, which was somewhere between last glacial maximum and modern, okay? So there's still a very important residual issue uh, as to what will happen when we look um, uh, at an initial condition, which is, which, is, which is much more reasonable. Next, please. So I want to talk, uh, just to end by commenting a little bit on the, how many, how many minutes have I got? One, five minutes? Okay. I'll just talk quickly about the teleconnections to low latitude that this model predicts when you, um, when you uh, um, signif significantly diminish the intensity of the mock by, f by freshening either in the Arctic or in the, or, or in the Atlantic. I'm going to look at two teleconnections, one to ENSO, uh, and, and most interestingly, um, uh, the teleconnection which we think has operated to produce the um, reaction in the Santa Barbara Basin and the productivity records that Jim, Jim Cannett has collected there. Okay. And these two uh, tele teleconnections uh, uh, operate through, I believe, entirely different mechanisms. Next, please. So first thing we can do uh, is to uh, investigate the ability of the model to what the model has to say about LGM and modern conditions with respect, with respect to, with respect to ENSO. And here, um, there are real issues in, in the community which, which I want to bring out by describing um, the, the way the CSM 1.4 model, what CSM 1.4 says should have happened to ENSO as you flip from modern climate regime into, into the LGM regime. Next, please. You can see here, just looking at the monthly cycle of, of the, uh, comparing the modern and, and uh, uh, LGM Nino 3 variants through the annual cycle, the, the CSM 1.4 model predicts a radical increase in, dramatic increase in, in variance in the Nino 3 region under LGM conditions. Next, please. If you look at the power spectra of the traditional uh, ENSO <coughs> indices, blue uh, is LGM, uh, red, uh, is, is modern, okay, you can see that this model predicts a very significant increase in the Nino 3, Nino 1 plus 2 uh, power uh, under LGM conditions compared to modern. And I want to draw attention here to a, a, an extreme difference between, well, a significant difference between this model, this NCAR model prediction, and what I believe to be the prediction of the NCAR CCSM 3 model. In NCAR CCSM 3, the prediction is actually of a decrease in the strength of ENSO at LGM. So here we have two different uh, NCAR models which make very significantly different predictions as to, in, in response to George's issue, what the response of ENSO is to a dramatic change in, in mean climate state. Answer is, according to the models, um, we have no robust result as to uh, <laughs> as to what the right answer to this question is. Next, please. This just shows the, um, the equatorial ocean uh, signature of the ENSO event in, in CSM 1.4, the eastward propagation of a significant depression in the equatorial thermocline um, that is characteristic of this event in a composite that's based upon an average over all of the ENSO events that occurred during the last thousand years of this 2,000 year uh, uh, spin up to equilibrium uh, of the of the LGM CSM 1.4 model. Next, please. <coughs> Flip. Next, please. <coughs> well, this is sort of also manipulated by this extremely beautiful computer <laughs> into an upside down position. <laughs> um, here is here is the. Uh, um, Free, this is a running power spectrum through the, uh, through the freshening event, through, the, through a hosing event. So now we're hosing the North Atlantic, and we're looking in the tropics and asking what happens to ENSO uh, during the hosing event. Okay? And you can see, I hope, um, here is pre-hosing, and we've got power much too, much too strongly concentrated around a period of about three years, as is uh, characteristic of most of the models that are now operating. Significant issue in this business is what is the problem, what is causing this overly sharp 
um, power spectrum of the ENSO signal. Many of us think it's vertical transport of, of momentum in cumulus towers. There are a lot of ideas in play. But what happens on hosing, this is the hosing interval. What we see is a, is a strengthening of ENSO, right? And a shift of the frequency of the ENSO event towards lo lower, lower frequency. These are <laughs> this is the 100 year uh, um, this is the 100 year hosing period. This is pre hosing. Okay, this is 100 year end of the hosing period, and then this is the recovery period. Okay, okay. <clears throat> so there's a very strong response, and I just comment in this model. There's also a spin off of, of, of the Hadley circulation by about 25 percent, a strengthening of the Hadley circulation by about 25 percent in response not only to LGM conditions, but to the shutdown of the THC, which is caused by freshening. So these results are, are quite consistent. W consistent When we freshen the North Atlantic and kill the thermohaline circulation, or shut it down significantly, we cause the same impact on ENSO from hosing in the North Atlantic as we cause by shifting the mean climate state from modern to last glacial maximum. Next, please. Just one comment on the, on the teleconnection into the, into the Santa Barbara Basin region. How is that signal exported from the, from the North Atlantic? One possibility is that it could, could be uh, a consequence of a direct modulation of the strength of wind-induced wind upwelling. One way to explain the lack of a time lag in, in, these, in these records, it looks like the dansgaard oscar oscillations um, that you observe in the GRIP and GISP2 ice cores are, are synchronous to within the limits of the data to distinguish with one another. Right? It looks as if the teleconnection occurs on a very fast time scale. Right? And so one way to understand this is through uh, a teleconnection that's mediated through, through the atmospheric general circulation. So to test this, we can look in the next, and I think the next, but yeah, the last uh, the last figure is to look at the uh, surface pressure in the control model, the surface pressure over uh, the southwestern United States in the, uh, in the hosing experiment, uh, and the difference in, in surface pressure between the freshwater forcing experiment and the control. And you can see that the organization of increases and decreases in the pressure field correspond to an onshore offshore component an onshore offshore component of the wind which you look at if you look at the sign of these patterns is consistent with the impact on productivity that is inferred on the basis of the Santa Barbara uh, uh, basin record between stadials and interstadials the wind? not very strong right this is in pascal not terribly not fair not terribly strong this is in pascals so what would that be in hundreds of pascals wind? It would be on the order of the meter per second, okay? Something of that order. An annual yeah. average. Depends on where you take the, the maxima. So it would be different. This is in Pascals from plus 400 on the top to minus 160 uh, in the lowest region and it depends on exactly where you do where you do the average the sign of the impact is right to explain the the impact on productivity um, the timing is right it's a possibility I won't argue any more strongly than that the other possibility is that the impact is actually through um, uh, an ENSO event that propagates to the north as a, as a coastal Kelvin wave. And these two possibilities we're trying to sort out by analyzing the data from this model. But this is a long term difference, right? How many years difference is something that's all? I mean, the two simulations are yes. years longer, something that's all longer? Yes. Yeah, these are averages over, I mean, in the, uh, in the, the surface pressure signal, signal in the control, this is an average over 20 years. In the surface pressure signal at one sphere reposing, this is an average over the last 20 years during the hosing interval. When the well, adjust that, is, that is quite likely that it's not significant at all, right? <coughs> I mean, if it's only 20 years, then I would say, hmm, have you shown any that one? No, no I, I think it's significant.
Yeah, well, Karen, check that. Yes. I don't need to believe it. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you.